Services Committee. Remember, that's those envelopes in the back of the chairs. He co-founded the UU Ministry for the Earth and currently serves as Vice President of the Unitarian Universalist Retired Ministers and Partners Association. He's the Emeritus Minister of All Souls UU Church in Kansas City. We welcome him. Good morning, it's great to be with you. I am honored to be with you in this pulpit and I am a great admirer of your senior minister, Christine Robinson, I think is one of the most accomplished and consummate of our colleagues. You are blessed. She said once that we overestimate what a minister can do in five years and underestimate what they can do in 20. You are indeed blessed. It is a joy for me to meet Angela Herrera. Angela said that when she got this pulpit, when she got to come and minister with you, she felt like she had won the lottery. I think, in fact, that maybe you won the lottery. <laughs> I want to um, say one thing is a form of introduction, or maybe two things is a form of introduction. Read a reading from the uh, Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan, and then move to the sermon. Um, I know that Unitarian Universalists, when you are hearing a public speaker, sometimes like to have an outline, some sense of where the service or sermon is going. Um, watch the bouncing chicken. I mean, <laughs> not the bouncing ball. The chicken will reappear throughout the talk. Follow the chicken. You'll see. <laughs> the, other, <clears throat> the other thing to say is that from my perspective, all discovery, all knowing and all intimacy with whatever or with whomever are forms of worship. Intimacy is worship. M.K. Gandhi said, live as if you're going to die tomorrow, learn as if you're going to live forever. To learn and discover is to worship. That said, let me bring a little bit of the topic closer to home. What is perhaps most troubling and sad about industrial eating is how thoroughly it obscures all relationships and connections. To go from the chicken to the chicken McNuggets is to leave this world on a journey of forgetting that could hardly be more costly, not only in terms of the animals' lives, but in terms of our own pleasure, too. But forgetting or not knowing is the first is in the first place is what the industrial food chain is all about. The principal reason it is so opaque, for if we are to see what lies far beyond and on the other side of the walls of industrial forms of agriculture, we would probably change the way we eat. Eating is an agricultural act. It is an ecological act. It is a political act. Though much has been done to obscure the simple fact how and what we eat determines the way we make use of our world and what will become of it. To eat with fuller consciousness of all that is at stake might sound like a burden, but in practice, few things in life could afford more satisfaction. In the end, this is about the pleasure of eating and the kinds of pleasures that come only from deep knowing. Eating is something that everyone does. Anyone here that doesn't eat? <laughs> everyone eats, it's necessary. It is an intimate activity that connects us with the very chain of life and with other people. Every bite we take nourishes us and makes our survival more likely and sustains our lives. What a precious treasure the food is that we eat and yet I believe that we take it so for granted. We just assume it. Sharing a meal connects us with the people who sit with us. Eating connects us with the very earth and the sun and to life and death itself. Is there a right way to eat? Well, I remember a time when the admonition was chew before you swallow. <laughs> I remember those times, and I want you to remember with me for a few moments. Think about your childhood home 
and the dining rituals and habits of your family of origin with me, if you would, for a few moments. Think about your family of origin and what it was like to eat with them. Some families have the ritual of always having dinner together. Certainly my family of origin did. And I'll tell you both about my family of origin and my family of creation. In my childhood family, every evening meal was shared together. Sunday dinner was particularly a high point occasion. We all went to church. Yes, Unitarian Church, All Souls Church in Tulsa. We would drive home and discuss the sermon and the church school, and then we would have a grand feast that my mother had somehow magically pre-prepared with timers and preparation and wonderful feast we would have. But I grew up in a family where it was a low one-income earner family, and there was not always enough food to eat. My father would take the meal and he would then serve each one of us and he would say to us, what is it that you want out of what was being served? He would, and we're back to the chicken, remember the chicken? We're back to the chicken. He'd say, would, what kind, which piece of the chicken would you like? And he would then parse it out and lo and behold, what would be left to him were the backs and the necks and the wings, which he claimed to like best, the leftovers and the backs in the wings. What I came to realize, and only actually fairly recently, was what he preferred was that we have enough to eat. And chose to eat less himself because at that time in our family's history, we did not have enough to eat. I grew up in Oklahoma, and what I want to tell you about Oklahoma now is that 20% of those people living in Oklahoma live, 20% of the people living in Oklahoma experience food scarcity. Hunger is a world issue. Distribution of food is a world issue. And we would like to believe that hunger is something that happens somewhere else, but it happens all over our country. And it happens in Oklahoma. Not having enough food to eat, makes each bite of food a precious gift. I remember the wonderful conversations my family had over dinner, and the quality of the food was always excellent. And as my parents' careers escalated in their capacity, we went from a family of abundant love and scarcity to a family of privilege and wealth and abundant love. My family of creation our food conversations are much more complex than in some ways than my childhood one was. Um, my older son, who when he comes to visit, he would just as soon have steak. <laughs> Medium rare and on the grill, thank you, Dad. <clears throat> my wife would just as soon be vegetarian. I'm the family cook, and my younger son is enamored of organic and locavore and rather insistent that we move in that direction. This is an interesting and challenging opportunity, and I get to compromise my way through it as the primary cook. But it reminds me of, thank you for laughing, it reminds me of a couple of jokes, nice segue. <laughs> a man walks into the doctor's office, he has a cucumber up his nose, a banana in one ear, and a carrot in the other, and he says to the doctor, 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 what's wrong with me? And he says, um, you're not eating properly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A lot of our conversations about eating properly are about eating too much meat or eating too much fat or too much sugar or too much junk food or et cetera. That's a separate conversation and one worth having. But the second joke I want to tell is more in the direction I want us to go. When a person goes to hell, let's presume hell for a moment. <laughs> person goes to hell and when they arrive in hell, they're given a tour. And the host says, let me show you down this hallway. This is the hallway where those people who have broken their religion's food laws are kept. And in this room are the Catholics when they weren't supposed to eat anything but fish on Friday, ate meat. See them all, things have changed, but they are still there. Down this way, this is the room where all the Jews who ate pork are. And you won't believe the next room, Unitarians, Unitarians who didn't drink fair trade coffee. 
<laughs> For the most part, Unitarian Universalists do not believe in hell. It tends to make God demonic. On the other hand, we do understand that there is hell here on earth and that one form of it is a guilty conscience and self-recrimination. And that comes when we violate our own sense of integrity and our own values. Like believing that we should have equitable treatment of those people who produce our food, that we should not live in such ways that, that what we consume is extractive and destructive to our planet. As a result, many of us do consume fair trade coffee. Not all. Many of us do consume fair trade coffee. And I want to, as a proponent of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, remind you that the Service Committee does offer fair trade coffee that you can sell in your congregation. And if you aren't, you're a big church and you ought to be. And not only that, for those chocolate lovers, they also sell chocolate that doesn't depend on child labor or slave labor. What I'm wanting to talk about is the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee's work and our becoming more conscious of what we do, particularly around our food consumption and the way in which we bring food out of the world and to our table and into our bodies. I believe that most of us walk around half asleep, mostly unconscious, much of the time oblivious and dropping into routines without examining who we are or what we do. I want us to become more aware of the food we consume, the gift of it, the integration of it into our bodies and where it comes from. A few months ago, earlier last year, I attended a meditation, silence, and yoga retreat. I like silence. I like deepening meditation, and I'm stiff and yoga won't hurt me too much. <laughs> One of the practices we were encouraged to use during this retreat was that we were to share meals in silence. I had never shared meals in silence in that same sense. It was a remarkable experience and we were asked to take each bite and to focus our attention on the food we were consuming. It changes the quality of the food. One of the things that the, um, our facilitator said is notice that you can actually put the fork down. <laughs> I had not become aware of the fact that when I eat, the fork hardly ever leaves my hand. And if you actually put it down and slow down, then the experience of eating changes. Appreciate the food. I want to use that as in part a metaphor to what I'm wanting to get at in a broader sense in terms of our human relationship to the food that you consume. I want you to make more conscious choices about what you eat and how you eat. Two religious issues within this context. <clears throat> Choice within existentialism is the very process with which we create meaning, right? Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, even in the midst of horror, you can still choose to be human and more deeply human by the choices you make, and that is a religious stance of integrity. That's about who we are as people of faith. Or I turn to process theology that says that everything is holy. God is not one, God is actually not God's name. It's a verb for the universe's becoming. And every piece and every molecule and everything within it continually in the process of becoming. And if you want to worship, take any piece of it and become connected to it and discover more about it. That's the kind of thoughtfulness I want you to engage in around your food. To take more pleasure, to take more savor, to savor it as you consume it. Not to be fast food nation, but to be slow food consumers, at least on occasion, to be slow food consumers. That said, <clears throat> I want to confess to you that I buy Tyson's large packages of chicken. I'm back to the chicken, remember the chicken? The big bags of uh, skinless chicken breasts that I get at Costco or Sam's and I find it's a whole lot easier. I just grab one and throw it in and cook it and it's dinner, right? Easy 
and easy some ways to stomach, and it's low fat, and that's good news. I want to contrast that with one, one or more of my experiences when I have gone to visit people in the third world and they have a special guest in their home and they go out and they pick one of the six chickens in their yard who will no longer lay eggs and make it available on their table for us to eat. What a profound gift. Or in my childhood growing up in a relatively poor neighborhood in Oklahoma, when I went to visit a friend and they said, well, is he staying for dinner? And they said, oh, yes, he is. And I watched the mother run out to the barnyard, grab the chicken and put it in the bucket. And I went, oh, my God. <laughs> and I'm going to eat that? But I want to tell you that is more palatable from my point of view now, as hard as that may be to envision as I tell it to you, than some of the horrors that are atrocities that are part of the industrial food chain that creates Tyson chicken that we think is so much easier to consume. We go to the supermarket and we buy cellophane wrapped animals, many of us who are omnivores. And if I ask you to kill that animal and eat it, could you? I think if you were more aware of the death that you create by the eating that you do, we would have more vegetarians. I believe. Tyson's Food nets $25 billion a year in sales annually centered in Springdale, Arkansas. Its corporate practices have enormous impact on human rights, climate change, animal welfare, and not generally for the better. They slaughter and process 5 million chickens, 50,000 pigs, and 25,000 cows every, every, every day. Over 2 billion animals they process. Most of those who do the slaughtering and work and the meat processing are women and people of color. The, the slaughtering happens at such a rate and at high speeds as a result, when surveys were done on fair labor practices, two-thirds of the workers reported having had injury or illness as related directly to the slaughtering activity that they were involved in. Two-thirds of the workers injured by working in the food processing industry. And at that time, the poultry industry estimated that they were supposed to each worker process 140 birds per minute in terms of the food processing. And the industry wanted the U.S. Agricultural Department to expand their ability to process to 175 birds, 175 birds a minute processed. Steps in the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee and their partner, the North Arkansas Center for Worker Rights, who want to address the violations of worker rights and human rights being perpetrated by Tyson and other food processors. I believe that there are enormous costs for low prices and that we can eat differently and slow down the food chain and increase the quality of what we eat. We don't have to kill the chicken in order to eat it. We don't, we don't. But when we consume it, we authorize it, right? I want you to take some of the energy that it would take to, to pluck the chicken and butcher the chicken and take that same energy. You're not gonna probably be the one who does the chicken, but you can take that same energy of intention and creativity and think about your food process and invest it in ways in which you and your family and your loved ones will be healthier by being more intentional, more thoughtful, and more creative. I've been talking about the food industry of your home and what's served on your table, but I want to shift it to restaurant workers. A lot of us, uh, our food rules at home are one thing, right? And then we go out to eat and all the rules are off the table. <laughs> But I want you to think consciously about your food, not just at your own home table and in your kitchen, but when you go out to work. What I know is restaurant er workers earn an average of less than $13,000 a year annual income. 
They, <clears throat> those who serve your food have a 70% more like, have, see, we get 70% of them are women and they are twice as likely to need food stamps as the general public. Working full time, they still have to get food stamps. Do you get the irony of that? Here they are in the food delivery industry and they have to get food stamps in order to feed themselves. And only 20% of restaurant workers have sick paid, paid sick days. And so the people who are the very people feeding you at restaurants can't afford to stay home, and so they feed you sick because they can't afford not to work. And in some, in some restaurant industries, if they can't get there, they have to find their replacement to come take their place or they'll get fired. There is a wonderful book called Behind the Kitchen Door. Seru... <laughs> Please stand up. This is, this is one of Restaurant Opportunity Center workers, organizers. I want to introduce to you Jamal Alcobar. She is, um, we, I met last night. She is one of the organizers of the restaurant workers trying to fight for equitable minimum wage for tip workers. It's part of the work. And two weeks from now, Saru is going to be here speaking to you. She is one of the leading advocates for equitable treatment of restaurant and food servers in the country. She's going to be here on the 7th at 1.30, at and you'll see out in the coffee table area information about her lecture and information about her book. It's the real thing, and it is one of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee's partners. It is not just the Service Committee's work. It's our work. We believe that people ought to be treated fairly and equitably. And one of the people doing that work is Saru and Jamal and others who join with them and say, restaurant workers need to be treated fairly. They are currently earning in some places nationally, the minimum wage is $2.13 an hour. $2.13 an hour. Of course they get all the tips, right? No, they don't get all the tips. In many cases, the restaurant owners then take the tips and parse them out, and they get sometimes as little as three or four percent of the tips they take. Short, 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 short. On the early service, we're on a time schedule, so it'll be real short. But I want you to see her and hear from her. She could go on probably as long as I can, but at least meet her. Well, I, I just want to compliment. Uh, I just want to compliment Reverend Eller because uh, he pretty much has it correct. Um, across the nation, there has not been a raise for tip wage earners for over 22 years thanks to Herman Cain and the other NRA, which is also known as the National Restaurant Association. Um, here in Albuquerque, obviously, there's a city mandate um, to have increased that minimum wage as, at the beginning of, since January 1 of this year. Thank you for your votes for that um, and helping the lives of people who very often end up getting on welfare, um, going to the emergency room rather than going to the doctor's office. Um, it is cyclical. There, are, I have met uh, people who are multiple generations of restaurant workers. So it, the issue is everywhere, and it is particularly done here as well. So thank you. It's, so often when I'm the out-of-town speaker coming in to cause trouble, I mean, it raise consciousness, I come in and I, I provoke you to think about your lifestyle and your work and your association, and then I leave and you go off and do whatever you want. But I have some accountability. She lives here. <laughs> 
and she'll be around doing the good work this week and next week. And two weeks from now when Saru is here, I assume that you'll be here to help host and to introduce as well as Martha and others. You are one of the good congregations. You're one of the good partners. You're one of the people doing the good work. For that, thank you. Thank you. So, so we'll be here and just grateful for the opportunity to speak to you soon. I want to tell you that there are lots of books about good eating. Fast Food Nation, Food First by Francis Moore LePay. I think of The Omnivore's Dilemma, one of my favorite books by Michael Pollan, Behind the Kitchen Door. Michael Pollan, who's a wonderful writer, has a new book called Cooked. It comes out in two weeks. It's a wonderful book, and the premise is that we outsource our food to industry and lose control of what we eat by doing so, and that if we cook more of our own food, we would live healthier. My premise and the whole point of my sermon and service this morning is I want you to become more conscious and to savor your food, to move into relationship with it so that you're more intimate and that it's not something that you just do as an expedient, but a form of communion with the cosmic nature of the planet and our life, to connect to it. Every time that you do so, you become more intimate, and I tell you it is an act of worship. It is the journey of a lifetime, and I tell you it needn't be a guilt trip, but an act of joy and thanksgiving. Indeed, may it be so.